Hello there. Welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Rochelle Harrison Pless. Good to have you with us. Coming up on the show. Syrian democratic forces tighten the noose around Raqqa, the Islamic State group's stronghold in Syria. As the troops edge closer to recapturing the key city, we have rare footage of the fierce fighting going on there. The diplomatic crisis between Qatar and its Arab neighbours continues, but for thousands of people in the Gulf, the row is threatening to destroy livelihoods and tear families apart. Plus, a pioneering group of female climbers from Jordan are gearing up to conquer Mount Everest. They're hoping to make history, but also inspire other women from the region to defy conservative stereotypes. We begin with the battle to stamp out the Islamic State group in Syria. Syrian democratic forces, backed by US-led coalition airstrikes, are closing in on the IS stronghold of Raqqa. Amid fierce clashes, the SDF are stepping up their bid to flush out the militants and recapture the city. Images of the fighting in Raqqa are extremely rare. The black flags of the Islamic State organization can be seen in the distance. The organization's de facto Syrian capital, Raqqa, is in the sights of these Kurdish fighters. Get the rocket launcher. They've spotted a suspect vehicle approaching. The battle is taking place in scorching heat. It is 40 degrees in the shade. We're not far from the heart of the city. We're coordinating so we can advance further. The jihadists in Raqqa boil oil and plunge men into it, those who disobey or who try to desert. The Kurds are allied with Syrian democratic forces, which have surrounded the city entirely. Backed by U.S. air power, they have entered parts of the city, beginning in the east. These images were filmed in areas where there's been no let-up in the fighting and bombing. Civilians are fleeing along this road, a road we're trying to protect. The city's usual population of around 300,000 is believed to be around half that. These families are finding freedom after years of being under IS control. We are fleeing death. That's all we're doing. They do not accept us as believers. We had to dress like them, grow our beards like they do, apply rules of Islam that they have made up, rules that have not been mine. I am 70 and they think they can teach me my religion? Three to four thousand jihadist fighters are believed to still be in Raqqa, among them many of Western origin, including French nationals. They have booby-trapped the city and have enrolled men and children in the fighting. Next, Qatar remains isolated after several of its Arab neighbours recently cut diplomatic ties and shut down transport links. Doha has been accused by Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates and Egypt of supporting and funding terrorists in the region. Those countries involved in the boycott have ordered Qatari citizens to get out and have also demanded their own nationals leave Qatar by the 17th of June. According to the rights group Amnesty International, for thousands of Gulf residents, the ongoing spat has turned their world upside down, the crisis destroying people's livelihoods and tearing families apart. This report from our correspondents in the region. At this crisis unit at Qatar's National Human Rights Council, lawyers are working around the clock to help families who are at risk of being separated. Fearing repercussions, many here wish to remain anonymous. But Fawaz wants to tell us his story. He moved to Qatar from Bahrain when he was just a few weeks old and has lived here ever since. This is my job. This is my family. This is my friend. This is my, all my life. I will not to go Bahrain. I don't have anything there. Only I have the, the Bahrain passport. That's it. After 35 years in Qatar, he's now being asked to give up everything because of a diplomatic spat. 11,000 citizens from Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain live in the kingdom. All of them unsure what the future holds. I cannot believe that. I think this is a joke maybe from the social media. 
If he doesn't leave Qatar within a week, he will find himself in breach of the law. Equally, thousands of Qataris living in neighboring countries will be forced to return home. In another part of the capital, lawyers like Garda Darwish are offering free legal aid to residents of the peninsula. We started to take cases on a pro bono basis. Let's say that uh, these people get a bit been involved. They've been blamed in this crisis. They are not a part of it. The diplomatic crisis has affected everyone here, even those whose home country is not involved in the dispute. 90% of Qatar's workforce are foreign nationals, like John, a taxi driver from Kenya. He fears a steep fall in tourism that may cost him his job. Because if the business becomes very down, surely you know the companies cannot sustain people. He started working in Qatar six years ago. His family in Africa depends on the money he sends back. That at least when I'm here, they are having a better life than when I was there. The sanctions on Qatar have wide-ranging consequences, but while the country's leaders have vast resources to fall back on, it is the ordinary population that is bearing the brunt. Right, let's take a look at some of the stories making headlines in the Middle East, both in the media and online on social networks. For that, I'm joined on set by Nick Rushworth. Hi, Nick. Now, we start with the diplomatic crisis in Qatar and the Gulf media war associated with that. Well, the Gulf media war and in the eye of the storm, Al Jazeera television, which has global reach, of course, and highly controversial in the Middle East. Now there, you can see uh, a tweet from CBS News saying, as tensions flare, um, Al Jazeera hit by cyber attack, um, hacking attempts across all systems. That was last week, um, just days after Saudi Arabia blocked the broadcasting of uh, Al Jazeera in Saudi Arabia. It cut the tubes, up popped Al Arabiya, uh, the TV station. This crisis has got the Washington Post headlining, could the Persian Gulf Rift mean the beginning of the end of Al Jazeera? Now, concretely, uh, Riyadh is accusing the network of promoting terrorist groups in the region. It's saying to tourist outlets, if you broadcast anything from Al Jazeera, you will be fined. Um, and so it goes on. The part of the pressure is a kind of tit-for-tat coverage we're seeing now we're, uh, between Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya, uh, strongly Saudi-backed. Al, Al Jazeera here has a report about Qatari nationals being restricted from entering the Holy Mosque in Mecca, immediately denied by Al Arabiya there in English, saying uh, Riyadh denying rumors. So the mouthpiece of uh, Riyadh very much in Al Arabiya's hands, and Saudi Arabia really pushing um, that station um, to take some of the, the role of, of Al Jazeera. OK, well, next, uh, a Syrian boy who made headlines uh, around the world last year has reappeared in interviews with uh, broadcasters, uh, broadcasters rather aligned with the Syrian government. Well, that boy is Omran. Remember last August, the picture that went viral around the world? There you can see it. And he um, is now one year, almost one year on, um, alive and well in Aleppo. His father has spoken out to Syrian media specifically. Now, um, what we've got is his father, Mohammed Daknish, saying that um, rebel groups were using his uh, son's image as propaganda against the government. He says rebel groups offered money, applied pressure for him to talk against the Syrian regime. Now, papers, uh, the Washington Post, The Guardian, are saying, uh, well, could these statements made to the Syrian media, were they made under pressure by the Assad regime itself? And that whole question about just the role of uh, children caught in the middle of this mm -hmm. kind of conflict, caught in the middle between uh, in what is a propaganda war, um, really, really another striking example of, of that one year on. Thankfully, many of the tweets out there saying just very grateful that he is alive and well. Um, his brother, of course, di died in the Aleppo um, attack. OK, and finally, Nick, uh, Wonder Woman, the movie, is not only uh, breaking records at the box office, uh, it's also making waves in the Middle East. Well, it's the world's most tweeted movie um, of 2017 so far. That's one headline for Variety magazine. Um, and around all those tweets, there's lots of controversy, um, specifically about the fact that um, the, the star, Gal Gadot, is Israeli. Now you can see um, one tweet saying, uh, the real 
pro-life Wonder Women of Palestine should be hailed, not uh, Gal Gadot uh, and her support for the Israeli Defence Forces. Uh, Gal Gadot was, was a member of those Israeli Defence Forces, like most Israelis are, and has, pr has, has supported, expressed support for the IDF. Uh, controversy within Israel itself is uh, there, you can see, of whether Wonder Woman Gal Gadot is white or a person of colour, and even more controversy still uh, for the feminists. Uh, why has she sh shaved her armpits in her role of, of Wonder Woman? So lots of buzz about Gal Gadot and that hit movie of the, of the summer, um, Wonder Woman. OK, Nick, thank you so much uh, for that. Nick Rushworth there. And finally, they've set their sights on conquering the world's highest mountain. A pioneering group of Jordanian women are currently training to climb Mount Everest in April next year. They'll be tackling obstacles such as altitude sickness and severe weather conditions on top of challenging the conservative norms back home. As the first all-female team from the Middle East to attempt the summit, they hope to make history together as well as inspire other women in the region to defy stereotypes and go after their dreams. Rebecca Rossman has more. These Jordanian women are hoping to become the first all-female team from the Middle East to summit Mount Everest. They're hoping to make a statement that will inspire other Arab women. One of the most important aims of our group is to make Arab women understand that you can choose where you go, wherever it is in the world, and no one can tell you otherwise. While the expedition isn't until April 2018, the group came to Nepal earlier this month for training, where they received lessons from climbing experts and local guides. The icy steep terrain comes in sharp contrast to Jordan, the country's highest point, Jabal Um Adami, is only a fifth as high as Mount Everest. Each of the five women are climbing to raise awareness for causes that are close to them. Aber Kali, an architect and designer, is trying to build a more sustainable tent. She's planning to test her design's durability during the climb. There are a billion people, most of them children, who have no home to live in. I want to take this opportunity to talk about this subject and present a solution by testing out my tent on Mount Everest. The women will have two more training trips before their big summit. Later this year, they'll have a training at the Pasu Diar peaks in Pakistan, followed by the Aconcagua in Argentina in early 2018. That's all for this week's Middle East Matters. Stay tuned to France 24. Lots more news coming up after this.